This is our situation for our question 8. A large equilateral triangle is subdivided into a set of small equilateral triangles by the following procedure. The midpoint of the sides of each equilateral triangle are joined to form a new set of smaller triangles. The procedure is repeated many times. But of course, we do not have many times on this diagram. We just have three occurrences. Now, the table below shows the result when the above procedure has been repeated twice. That is, when n is equal to 2. And we need to calculate the number of triangles formed when n is equal to 3. But how? Number of triangles is equal to 4 to the power of n. And that is the only simple relationship relating the number of triangles to n. Notice that we have 0 maps to 1, 1 maps to 4, and 2 maps to 16. Good if we realize that if we raise 4 to the power of 1, we will get 4. If we raise 4 to the power of 2, we will get 16. And of course, any number raised to the power of 0 is 1. So, this is the relationship, no doubt. So, we need to find the number of triangles formed when n is equal to 3. So, that will be equal to 4 to the power of 3, which is equal to 64. Also, what do we need to determine? The number of triangles formed when n is equal to 6. So, that is 4 to the power of the number n which is 6 in this particular case so 4 to the power of 6 and that turns out to be 4096 a shape has how many small triangles 65,536 triangles and we need to determine the value of n so let's see how we will do that the number is always a power of 4. So the number of triangles is always a power of 4. We will use repeated division by 4 with the number given and take note of the number of times that this may be done. So repeated division by 4 and see how many times we'll be able to divide by 4. So let's go. Dividing that by 4, we get 16,384. Then if we divide by 4 again, we get 4,096. Of course, realizing that dividing by 4, we get 4,096, which is what we have here. So we know that we should have another 6, and we have 2 here. So no doubt, we should have 8. So in saving time in the examination, we do not need to carry out the procedure any further. So we know that n is equal to 8. But... Let's see, 4 into 40,096 is 10,024. And 4 into 10,024 is 256. And divide into 64, 4 into 64 is 16, 4 into 16 is 4, and 4 into 4 is 1. So this is done to show you that even if we had a situation that did not give us the value of our 4 to the power of 6. We would have been able to determine by continue dividing by 4. But of course, we should have been able to determine the value of n at this stage where we have 4096, which is what we have for the power of 6. So we have the number of 4s will be the value of n. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So n is equal to 8. Finally, I hope, finally, determining number of small triangles in a shape after carrying out the procedure m times. If we carry out the procedure m times, how many triangles will we have? If the procedure is carried out m times, the number of triangles will be represented by 4 raised to the power of n. We will continue 
by factorizing a trinomial. So there is the trinomial, and of course, when factorizing a trinomial, we take the coefficient of the square of the symbol. So the one that has the square, we take that coefficient and we multiply by the constant value. So we say 2 times 3, and that is equal to 6. So we are searching for the two numbers that will multiply to give a positive 6, and when we add them, we get a negative 7. Those two numbers are negative 6 and negative 1, and they will become the two middle terms of the quadratic expression. So in factorizing a trinomial, we need to resolve this middle term into its two component and uh, the, the coefficients of the two middle terms will be determined by the process that we have just followed and of course we are going to write the expression as a quadratic or in four terms we will use factorization by grouping in this one also so we are going to take the first two terms and factorize them of course making use of the common factor what number can go into 2p squared well we are just taking the coefficients 2 can go into 2 and 2 can go into 6 and then p can go into p squared and p so we have a common factor of 2p then we will say 2p into 2p squared the 2's will cancel and p into p squared is p and of course 2 into 6 is 3 and the p's will cancel then as a rule the sign that begins the second pair is used as a sign of the common factor so we have the second pair negative p plus 3 the sign that begins that pair is negative 1 so we will use negative as the sign of the common factor of course we do not have any obvious factor common factor of p and 3 so we are going to use 1 so our common factor is negative 1 so negative 1 into negative p so that's a negative into a negative it's positive and then negative into positive is negative so when we are factorizing we find the common factor and we divide through by the common factor sign and all we have a common factor of p minus 3 here there so we have p minus 3 is a common factor and of course 2p minus 1 will occupy the second pair of brackets of course this 2p minus 1 did not appear in the brackets by magic as we will see in the next problem that we are about to solve of course Richard J's mathematics resources can be consulted to, to justify the placing of 2p minus 1 in the other bracket which is of course we might think automatic but there is a very serious principle behind that which justify its correctness so we have 5p plus 5q plus p squared minus q squared and we need to factorize that completely here we have no problem seeing a common factor of 5 here we should have no problem either but sometimes students expect to see the difference of two squares all by themselves way out there in the wilderness so there is nothing to see but the difference of two squares but we will not see that all the time we see a difference of two squares right here and it's also involved in an expression in such a way that it is not the only thing there to factorize so of course no problem seeing the common factor here of 5 so we take 5 and of course p 5 into 5p is p and 5 into 5q is q here we have difference of two squares that we usually factorize by site p plus q p minus q so let us go straight ahead and do that so we have 5 to be multiplied by p plus q 
and of course p plus q multiplied by p minus q so we have all the factors right there now we need to factorize that further as a matter of fact generally the problems in CXC the statement of a problem that we usually get is factorize completely so we are going to factorize completely we have done a factorization we have gone through a factorization process already but we have further factorization to complete so the process continues we can find a common factor of p plus q in this term and p plus q in this other term that we have there so we have a common factor of p plus q so in true factorization fashion we will separate the common factor and use the common factor to divide into the other factor and we will get the result so um, just see how the process is carried out now we are going to go all the way back to first principle of factorization in which we take the common factor out right there so we have the common factor of p plus q right there and there so the common factor goes there then the other factor will be the result of dividing the terms by the common factor we have this first term 5 p plus q that's the first term and the second term p plus q p minus q now so how do we proceed we proceed by dividing this term by which is this one that we have here by p plus q and this term that we have here by p plus q we will see that the fraction will be reduced quite simply because we have a common factor of p plus q so we take the common factor we are just continuing into the other step of which we already know that p plus q is a common factor so those two will cancel each other and we have five left and of course over here we have p plus q cancel each other and of course we have p minus q left but we cannot do that being negligent of the sign that separates the two terms so we have 5 plus p minus q is the other term and that we can see was arrived at by using the first principle of factorization and should not be too much of a problem here we are expected to expand x plus 3 all squared multiplied by x minus 4 now the biggest mistake that students make is that in expanding x plus 3 all squared they write x squared plus 9 totally neglecting the fact that when we expand the perfect square we have a middle term that is equal to 2 times the first time the second so we have a middle term that is 2 times x times 3 so that will be 6x the first factor of the expression is a perfect square we should be accustomed to writing down the expansion in one step that is what is expected at the CSEC level that we can write down the expansion of a perfect square in one step and of course this is our perfect square the square of x is there the square of 3 is there and of course our middle term that is the one that we forget generally forget x times 3 and the result is multiplied by 2 so the middle term is 2 times the first times the second and then we multiply by x minus 4 now what do we expect well we are expected to multiply all of this by this and uh, of course let us be systematic about it so use the x to multiply each term in the first bracket so this is the x that we have here we're going to use this x to multiply the terms in the first bracket x multiplied by x squared is x cubed and then x multiplied by 6x is 6x squared and then 9 multiplied by x no doubt we have 9x what do we do next after we have exhausted this x meaning that we have used it to multiply all of these terms then we move down to the negative 4 so use the negative 4 to multiply each of the terms in the first bracket 
terms of the same order are aligned vertically for clarity. So what we do is we say negative 4 times x squared and we're going, we are going to put that result under this x squared term that we have there. So let's go. Negative 4 times x squared is negative 4x squared and uh, plus 6x to be multiplied by negative 4 we have a negative 24x and then we have negative 4 times 9 which is negative 36 of course in expanding and simplifying we generally for algebraic expressions as is explained in Richard James mathematics resources we combine like terms and of course we are going to combine like terms by adding the coefficients but in this particular case we did not just throw the terms right in an expression and then search for them at the end we ensure to put the terms with the like terms vertically below each other so in the end the addition process is very simple so let us go now the x cube goes back there is no other term in x cube and then we are going to combine those two 6x squared minus 4x squared is a positive 2x squared and then we have a all of 9x then we need to combine that with a negative 24x so that is going to be a negative 15x and finally the negative 36 will take its place right and of course we were expected to give our answers in descending powers of x that means we have the powers of x decreasing each time so this is x cubed x squared and when we do not see an index we know that that is x to the power of 1 and of course we have 36 which is multiplied by if we want to take a look at it that way x to the power of 0 x to the power of 0 is 1 so 36 multiplied by 1 is 36 as a matter of fact negative 36 times 1 will be negative 36 so we'll have we'll have no problem with that one there we have an expression and we are going to write it in the suggested form and the suggested form requires a completion of the square or completing the square so first we will complete the square by doing a partial factorization of the first two terms so we will take the x squared coefficient as a factor so that we can just have x squared alone but in so doing with these two terms this one is going to be affected so in normal factorization fashion we say 2 into 2x squared that is x squared and 2 into 4x that is 2x right and the first two terms are required to be in the bracket so we have no problem seeing that the middle term is going to be affected in some way as a matter of fact if we try to expand this we will result in this so we say 2 times x squared is 2x squared and 2 times 2x is 4x so this is actually equal to this and that is what we are driving at that at each stage the one that we have is equal to the one before then we take half of the middle coefficient and square it so we are completing the square we want a square inside of the bracket and that is the procedure so we are going to take half of this coefficient which is 2 that we have there and square it half of 2 is 1 square 1 we get 1 so the square is completed inside of that bracket x squared plus 2x plus 1 as a matter of fact after introducing this positive one here by completing the square this is when we have this expression being different from this one so make an adjustment because of the new term that was introduced which is this plus one this positive one was introduced so we need to make an adjustment so we need to subtract this positive one that we have added to the expression right so we are subtracting 2 we cannot do that unless we multiply by this 2 that is in front of the bracket so this one that we have there that we want to subtract we have to multiply by 2 first because everything inside of that bracket is multiplied by 2 so we subtract 2 now of course we need to write this as a perfect square 
So we have x squared plus 2x plus 1. That is what we have. So what do we square to give x squared? x. What do we square to give 1? 1. So it is x plus 1 all squared. And of course we have negative 5 minus 2. And that is equal to negative 7. We need to state the equation of the axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry will cross the x-axis where the expression enclosed in brackets is equal to 0. So we have where x plus 1 is equal to 0. So if x plus 1 is equal to 0 and we solve that equation, we get x is equal to negative 1. Next, we need to state the coordinates of the minimum point. So the x ordinate, we have it already, is negative 1 and the y ordinate is a constant value. So the coordinates of the minimum point is negative 1, negative 7. The minimum point and the axis of symmetry are required in the sketch. So we are going to sketch the graph. But the two points of interest are the minimum point and the axis of symmetry. So let us show the x and y ordinate associated with axis of symmetry and the minimum point. So the axis of symmetry has equation x is equal to negative 1, negative 1. So that is the axis of symmetry. And of course, the minimum point is negative 7 for the y value. So we have a negative 7 right there. The minimum point on the graph should coincide with negative 1, negative 7, which is this point that we have right there, which is this. The curve also needs to be symmetrical about the line x is equal to negative 1. So let us cause that curve to be symmetrical about the line x is equal to negative 1 and the minimum point to be negative 1, negative 7. And there we have our sketch of the curve as required. Number 10. Pam visits the stationery store where she intends to buy X pens and Y pencils. Pam must buy at least three pens. So X pens, X is the number of pens. So at least three, what does that mean? At least three means three or more. So X is greater than or equal to three. The total number of pens and pencil must not be more than 10. So we are going to write an inequality to represent this. The total must not be more than 10. So if it is not more, it may be equal to 10 or it may be less than 10. So we have the total, the sum of x and y, not more means less than or equal to. So x plus y is less than or equal to 10. Each pen costs $5 each, and each pencil costs $2 each. More information about the pens and pencils is represented by an inequality that we have right there. So we are required to interpret that inequality in a verbal way. Write the information represented by this inequality in your own words or in our own words that's what we are required to do the cost of each pen is five dollars and the cost of each pencil is two dollars so each term on the left hand side has a number of items multiplied by the cost of each so this is the number of items and we multiply by the cost number of items multiplied by the cost so if we are multiplying items by the cost and adding we are looking at the overall cost the total amount spent buying pens and pencils must be less than or equal to 35 we will draw the graph of the inequalities but first let us prepare to graph the third inequality by finding two points through which 
the associated line passes and of course what are we going to do but make use of the fact that the x and y are located on the left side of the equation and a constant value is on the right and by so doing we can find the two points necessary to graph that line quite easily of course we need two points to draw a line and in Richard James Mathematics Resources a third error correcting point is suggested in a little bit more unfavorable circumstances but this one in this particular case if we try to find an error correcting point which is a third point it is going to be more difficult than finding the first two therefore if there is any error it is the error correcting point that will contain it and that is not a very good proposition at all so what we will do is ignore the error correcting point because if it is going to be found it is going to be more difficult to be found than the the original points that we are going to use so draw the line and uh, that is not a very desirable prospect at all let x equal 0 that is the method that we are using and if x is equal to 0 then 2y is equal to 35 then y is equal to 17.5 the coordinates of the point will be 0 for the x x is 0 and the y value is 17.5 so 0 17.5 when y is equal to 0 on the other hand we have 5x is equal to 35 because the y value is 0 so 5x is equal to 35 so x is equal to 7 so the coordinates will be in this particular case 7 for the x and 0 for the y based on the information we will graph the inequalities the first line x is equal to 3 is a vertical line that crosses the x-axis at 3 the second line has equation x plus y is equal to 10 when x is equal to 0 y is equal to 10 and when y is equal to 0 x is equal to 10 the line will therefore pass through the points 0 10 and 10 0 0 10 is that one where the x value is 0 and the y value is 10 and in that one we have x is 10 and the y value is 0 so the point will be right there no movement in the vertical direction because y is equal to 0 or the y ordinate is equal to 0 and that is our land two points through which line 3 passes were determined on the previous slide we will remember them 0 17.5 which is that one right there and 7 0 which is that one and when we are through we have our line right there and uh, let's see if there is anything we are sure that anything that is asked further cannot be anything too difficult write the coordinates of the vertices of the region that satisfies the inequalities and that is what we are going to do so we are going to identify the region that satisfies all three inequalities and write down its vertices so that is the region and first vertex we have 5 5 the other one we have all the way to 7 and then 0 then we have 3 7 and of course finally we have 3 0 there we have them mentioned right there with the exception of 3 0 To find the total profit, we multiply the profit and the pen $1.50 by the number of them, which is X. Do the same for the pencils. $1 for the profit and Y for the number of them. And then we add the two products and we will get the profit. So we have there the total profit is the profit on each pen multiplied by the number of pens and of course the profit on each pencil is 1 
and we are multiplying that by the number of pencils which is y which is 1 multiplied by y is equal to y so that is our objective function find the profit in each case that is what is required in this section so let us find the profit in each case so we have when x is equal to 5 and y is equal to 5 what do we have 1.5 times 5 plus 5 so that is about 12.5 well it is exactly 12.5 and then we go 1.5 x so we have 1.5 times 7 plus 0 of course 1.5 times 7 is 10.5 right and then we have another one 1.5 x plus y 1.5 times 3 is 4.5 plus 7 that will give us 11.5 right so we have in this case $12.50 $10.50 $11.50 we did not imagine that this vertex could give us a maximum profit because it is the one whose values of x and y of course the x and y ordinates are the least so it will by no means give us a maximum profit take note of the maximum profit so the maximum profit which is the largest one is twelve dollars and fifty cents so we have identified our maximum profit in the specified region identify four pens so let us identify four pens that is on the horizontal axis that is where we have it four pens and take note of the maximum y value possible within the region so within the region what is the maximum y value possible if we are here at four all the way up to there which is of course six so we have there six pens and of course we are answering if Pam buys four pens show on your graph the maximum number of pencils she can buy if Pam buys four pens what is the maximum number of pencils that she can buy and that is what we have discovered just now we will move merrily on well I think that we are going to have a lot of fun there the two circles with centers P and Q and radii 5 cm and 2 cm respectively are drawn so that they touch each other at T and a straight line XY at S and R so we have a straight line like that which is the one that we see right there now state with a reason why PTQ is a straight line we need to state why PTQ is a straight line both circles will share a common tangent at the point T so we are going to see if we can explain why PTQ is a straight line so both circles will share a common tangent at the point T PT is the radius of a large circle and is perpendicular to the tangent no problem then what TQ is the radius of the small circle and is perpendicular to the tangent PTQ will therefore be a straight line because at the point of tangency this radius is perpendicular and this radius is perpendicular next we are going to give or find the length of PQ and we are going to give reasons so find the length of PQ PT is the radius of a large circle which is 5 centimeters TQ is the radius of a small circle and that is 2 centimeters so if this is 7 and this is 2 then no doubt PQ will be 5 plus 2 which is equal to 7 centimeters 
So we need also to state why PS is parallel to QR. So see if we can do that. Why PS is parallel to QR. The line XSRY is a tangent to both circles. So it is tangential to both circles. PS and QR are radii of both circles. And we know that the radius and the tangent are perpendicular to each other. So PS and QR are both perpendicular to the line XSRY and are therefore parallel to each other. Now we need to do our calculations. So let us calculate the length PN. So show N on S such that QN is perpendicular to PS. So N, as the information state, is the point on PS. So N is on PS in such a way that QN is perpendicular to PS. And that is what we have right there. So we know that QR is equal to SN is equal to 2 centimeters. Good. And then the entire length PS is 5 centimeters. So if we have 2 centimeters here and the entire thing is 5 centimeters, what do we know? PN is equal to 5 minus 2, which is equal to 3 centimeters. So that is not an alarming result at all. Need to determine the length of RS. So remember, PQ is 7 centimeters. We are making use of things that we have known so far. PQ is 7 centimeters. And we need to find the length RS. So we need to find RS. Kind of look a little bit far-fetched, but we will show in a short while that it is well within our grasp. Okay? So we need to determine the length RS. So SR is equal to QN. So SR is equal to QN. Good. SR is equal to QN. QN is one of the short sides of the right angle triangle PNQ. See? Right. So we, sh we are seeing now that QN is one of the short sides of the right angle triangle PNQ, which is that right angle that we are talking about. With the length of the other two sides known, we may use Pythagoras theorem to find the length of NQ. Hence, SR, because NQ is equal to SR and we want to find RS or SR. So if we find NQ, then we would have found SR. So SR is equal to NQ, which is actually equal to the square root of 7 squared minus 3 squared. Do not forget that what is known here is the long side or the hypotenuse of the right angle triangle. Therefore, we need to determine the length of one of the short sides. So it is not going to be 3 squared plus 7 squared, but we are finding a short side has to be what? 7 squared minus 3 squared. As a matter of fact, if we use plus 3 squared here, the result will be greater than 7 and we will have one side of a right angle triangle that is longer than the hypotenuse, which of course we know to be a total impossibility. So simplifying, we have 7 squared 49, 3 squared 9, so we have the square root of 44 SR. So SR is equal to 6.3 centimeters. Here is one of our favorite. We need to calculate MNL. We need to calculate MNL. And what do we know? We have two angles are subtended by the same chord. The angle at the center is always twice the one at the circumference when they are subtended by the same arc or chord. So the angle at the center is twice the one at the circumference or for the purpose of this calculation we may say that the one at the circumference is half 
of the size of the one that is at the center. So we have this angle MNL is equal to a half of this one that we have at the center and that is 55 degrees. We need to determine LMO. LMO. But we have triangle MOL is an isosceles. Of course, we have isosceles triangle because this is the radius. This is the radius. So those two sides are actually equal. So the triangle MOL is an isosceles triangle in which angles LMO, LMO, and O. L, M are equal. The other angle, M, O, L, is known. So we have the two equal angles are unknown and the one that we have right there is the other angle. So that is the isosceles triangle that we are talking about. So L, M, O is equal to 180 degrees minus 110 degrees divided by 2 because these two angles are equal and we need to calculate this one each one is what the rest and we divide by 2 so the result turns out to be 35 degrees a boat leaves a dock at point A and travels for a distance of 15 kilometers to point B on a bearing of 135 degrees. The boat changes course and travels for a distance of 8 kilometers to a point C on a bearing of 060 degrees. Illustrate the above information in a clearly labeled Venn diagram and we need to show the north direction. So. The boat travels on a bearing of 135 degrees. So beginning from north, this may be shown by a line going down below the horizontal and to the right. Now, let us show that. There we have it. Notice that if we have north here and we have east there, that north and east will make an angle of 90 degrees. But the angle that we are looking for is greater than 90 degrees. So it needs to go down below the horizontal. Also, a straight line is responsible for an angle of 180 degrees. And we, we are sure that this is less than 180 degrees, so we will have it between east and south. So 135 degrees will be right there. And of course, our diagram is not expected to be drawn to scale. A change of course requires another north line. Remember that the, there's a change of course, so we, not, we have to have another north line. The bearing is less than 90 degrees. Of course, it is 60 degrees, less than 90. The line representing this course should be to the right and above the horizontal. Do not forget that the horizontal is east, which is 90 degrees from north. But it is less than 90 degrees, so we are sure that the angle is to be in this region. There is no trigonometry without triangle. So we complete the triangle by joining the point C to A. The point C to A. The north direction is already included in the diagram as we have there. Right. So insert the bearings 135 degrees and 60 degrees, 0, 060 0 degrees. So we have them right there. 135 degrees there, and of course, 60 degrees there. Identify the distance is 15 kilometers and 8 kilometers. Good. After we have done that, we are required to make calculations. Calculate the distance AC. We need to find the distance AC. We know the distance is AB and BC. Of course, they are given A, B, and BC. They are known distances. An application of the cosine rule requires that we know the angle ABC that the two sides form.
So we are going to find AC, which is of course finding the length of any side if the other two sides and the angle that the other two sides form are known. We can use the cosine rule to find the length AC. Now, how do we apply the cosine rule? d squared plus d squared minus 2 times this times this times cosine of the angle that the two sides form. But in this particular case, we can see blatantly 60 degrees right here, but we do not know the one that we have over here. Extend the north line at a downward, so that is what we are trying to do now to determine this angle. This will give angles on a straight line. So now we have angles on a straight line, and what do we have? If 135 is given, the remainder is 45 degrees. So angles on a straight line, one of, one of them is 135 degrees, the other one is 45 degrees, and 45 degrees go it's right there. Alternate angles that we generally call Z angles are equal. The remaining portion of the angle at B is therefore 45 degrees. So there we have our quote unquote Z and the 45 degrees will be right there. So the entire angle is known. So we have the cosine rule to be applied. AC squared is equal to D squared plus D squared minus 2 times this times this cosine of 105 degrees. So the entire angle is 105 degrees and we will apply the cosine rule in finding AC. There we have it. As we explained before, AC squared equal to 15 squared plus 8 squared minus 2 times 15 times 8 or 8 times 15 multiplied by cosine of 105. Which we will continue to simplify and the result is AC is equal to the square root of 351 and that turns out to be 18.7 kilometers and of course we insert it right there just so that we may be reminded when it becomes necessary for us to use in further calculation Now, we need to determine the bearing of A from C. So the bearing of A is taken from C. From C means that the angle is located at C. But what angle can we find? We can only find the angle that is inside of the triangle. So the cosine rule may be used. We are going to use the cosine rule to find the angle that is inside of the triangle. Is that going to be the bearing? Okay, let's see how it works out. In order to determine the bearing of A taken from C, we have to make use of the one that we can, the only thing that we can make use of, which is the angle that is at C, that is inside of this triangle. So let us find that angle. So cosine of C, we are going to call that angle C. Cosine of C is equal to, when we are finding that angle, we need to apply the cosine ruling saying the two sides that form the angle, they are added. The squares are added. So two sides that form the angle, the angle is at C, 18.7 squared, 8 squared. Minus the other one. So the two that we have added here are the two that form the angle. Then we minus the other one, which is the other side the side opposite to the angle or the one that does not form the angle so minus 15 squared and again we go back to the two sides that form the angle 2 times 18.7 times 8 and of course when we simplify we get C is equal to cos inverse of 0 0.64 and of course that is equal to 50.6 degrees. We may round that off to a whole number. So the bearing is taken from C. The north line must therefore be placed at C. 
bearing is measured in a clockwise direction beginning at north. So there we have angle that represents the bearing. An angle alternate to 60 degrees is known. Right. So we have an angle alternate to 60 degrees. Right. So we know that this angle is also 60 degrees. And what else? With the angle on a straight line being 180 degrees, we have what? The bearing is given by 180 plus 60. And of course, we are going to round this off. So we have 180 plus 51 plus 60. And that turns out to be 291 degrees. So insert the point X on OM such that OX is equal to one third of OM. So that is what we have also that OX is one third of OM. We have it right there. PX is equal to four XQ. So insert the segment PXQ. So PX is equal to 4XQ. So P to X is 4 times the distance from X to Q. And what else do we know? We know that OX is equal to 1 third OM. That means from O to X is 1 third the distance from O to M. So we have OM is equal to let's see om let's go r and s so om is r plus s om is r plus s that is what we need to determine om and it is equal to r plus s then we need to determine px the vector px is equal to the sum of the vectors P O and O X. So to go from P to X we go P to O then O to X. So P to O then O to X. Notice that this is going in the opposite direction to R and P X is equal to negative R plus one third. Remember that O X is one third of O M. So let's go again. Negative R plus one third of OM and one third of this. So one third of R plus S. One third of all of R plus S. So it is one third of R plus one third of S. When we simplify that, we get negative R plus one third of R. So negative two thirds of R. So we will put the positive S first. So we'll get plus one third of S, which is one third of S, minus two thirds of R. So that is what PX is equal to. Then we need to find QM. So let us find QM. The vector QM is equal to the sum of the vectors QX and XM. Qx is equal to one quarter of Px, but it goes in the opposite direction. The vector xm is two thirds of the vector om. So the vector qm is equal to the sum of qx plus xm. Let's see. qx plus xm. So it is what? Remember that this is four times this. So this that we have right here is a quarter of the total Px. And of course we know Px already. So we are going to throw in a quarter of Px. But we know that it goes in the opposite direction. And of course, see, Px goes down like this. Qx goes up like that. So while we are taking a quarter of it, we need to go in the opposite direction. That means we are going to take the negative of it. So a quarter of the negative of right and that is going to be included 
and of course we have xm going from x to m so let us work that out of course xm is equal to two-thirds of om we know om already but xm is two-thirds of om based on the instruction that were given about the problem at the beginning so qm is equal to let's go from q to m by qx is negative a quarter and that is plus two-thirds of so we have negative a quarter of and plus two-thirds of so there we have a lot of fraction so we have a fraction soup right there so we have now expanding this we have negative 112 no problem and of course this 4 will cancel with this 2 so we have negative 1 sixth to be multiplied by a negative so we have a plus there so we have a positive one sixth of r over here no problem seeing that this is two thirds two thirds so two thirds of r two thirds of s then we are going to put all of those together in one expression put in the r's together and the s's together of course what is two thirds if we should use a denominator of 12 2 thirds of 12 is what? 8 over 12 so we have 8 8s eight over 12 for this one and we subtract 1 12 so, so 8 minus 1 is equal to 7 and that is why we have 7 twelfths of s right there and of course the other one that we need to work out with the r's here we have them 2 over 3 is the same as 4 over 6 so 4 6 of r and 1 6 of r we have 5 6 of r so fractions can be added quite easily and the result is right there as we have it we need to show that pn is equal to 2 pm plus op 2 pm plus op now pn where is pn yeah pn is all the way from here to here to get from p to n we go from p to m then from m to n as we have it there p to m then m to n replace m n with o m because of course o m and m n are the same vectors so we can replace p n with o m like that they are equal now pn is equal to what is pm equal to we have pm going right there and then we have om so om is actually what op plus pm right so om is op plus pm and that is equal to when we put them together these two pm's will be added together to be two pm's so pn is equal to two pm plus op now we have a matrix d right there and we are told that it is singular so we need to determine the values of p if the matrix is singular is determinant is equal to zero so determinant we have now one times four is right there and nine p times p is right there so this times this minus this times this and the result has to be zero so this is four minus nine p squared is equal to zero and no doubt we have the difference of two squares and we are going to solve that equation for p and see what we get p is equal to plus or minus two-thirds so we have a system of linear equations first we need to write the equations in matrix form there we have it the coefficients of x and y will be in one two by two matrix 
x and y will be in a vertical column matrix and of course the answer is in a column matrix and we are going to follow the instruction we are not going to jump and just solve the equations we are going to follow the instruction giving the examiners what is required instead of demonstrating that we are good at mathematics so we have written the equation in the form then we need to calculate the determinant of a so do that we are given marks for everything that we are required to do if they say find the determinant by finding the determinant we will get marks so the determinant will be 2 times 4 minus 3 times 5 2 4 is 8 minus 5 3 is 15 we will get a negative 7 then we need to show that a inverse is equal to and of course the matrix representation of A inverse is given right there so what is A inverse? 1 over the determinant multiplied by the adjoint the adjoint is formed by changing the places of these two that we have right there changing the places and of course after we have done that we need to change the signs of these two and that is what we have there then 1 over the determinant, we need to take the 1 seventh inside, multiplying each term. We have negative times positive is negative 4 over 7. Negative times negative is positive, and that's 5 over 7. Then negative multiplied by negative is positive, and that is 3 over 7. Finally, negative times positive is negative, and of course, 2 over 7. Use the matrix A inverse to solve for x and y. So, they do not require that we go through all the steps. They say there, use the matrix inverse to solve for x and y. So, we're going to use A inverse to solve for x and y. Now, we have A inverse right here. And, of course, you know that Richard James is not going to tell you to use the fractions to multiply. He's going to say, take the fraction outside, leave the whole numbers inside, multiply and then make use of the fraction at the end so we have row so we have upper times the column matrix so we have negative 4 6 plus 5 8 so negative 4 6 plus 5 8 down here we have 3 6 plus negative 2 8 and of course negative 24 there and positive 40 there so we're going to say 40 minus 24 and that is going to be equal to 16 and of course of course 3 6 is 18 minus 16 and that is equal to 2 here we have 16 and 2 and we need to divide each one of them by 7 or to multiply by 1 over 7 so x is equal to 16 over 7 y is equal to 2 over 7